We're going to wait just a minute or two, and then we'll we'll begin. Would like to uh, send out congratulations to the Lander women's basketball team. While they didn't win, they, uh, the women and the coaching staff, Coach Pedersen and so forth, represented Lander very well. Uh, the games were tremendous, and hey, just to get to the Final Four is, is, a, is just unbelievable. So congratulations to them. I would like to mention also that uh, the baseball team will be playing at Fleur Field in Greenville, playing uh, North Greenville College on Tuesday the 30th. Uh, it's information on the alumni website. We'd love to have those of you that can join us. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move into our program. I want to welcome you to our webinar featuring Professor Dan Harrison and his book, Live at Jackson Station. Uh, Dan is professor of sociology in the College of Behavior and Social Sciences, has been teaching at Lander for about 15 years. He lives in Greenwood with his wife, Rebecca Salter Harrison, and their two children. Dan, we welcome you to our webinar, and maybe you could get us started with what drove you to come up with this this story, this topic uh, for a book? Well, thank you very much, Randy, and thank you, Debbie, and uh, thank you, Mike, and, and everybody else. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of the uh, participants here today. And uh, like Randy, I'd like to start off by congratulating the uh, Lander uh, basketball team yesterday for their amazing performance and and obviously they they fell short but uh you know they just make the whole school and community so proud i i think through their efforts and uh i had one of the um players sarah cruz who's, who's a very prominent player on the team she's that sociology major and uh and she's just been a, a real joy to have um but thanks a lot for the invitation and um I'm really thrilled to uh, be here to, to talking about my book, Live at Jackson Station, which is a project that I've been working on uh, since about 2014 formally. Um, I'm not sure if uh, people are familiar with um, Jackson Station, but I would uh, welcome any questions or comments or anecdotes that, that you may have. Uh, Randy, I think I'll leave it up to you to, to monitor the, uh, the, the chat um, or Debbie or, or someone. I, I'm not yeah, sure if I we'll can. We'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and just relay any questions or comments um, that people may have. Um, but I, as Randy said, I've, I've been in Greenwood now for uh, about 15 years. I was at Furman University for a year before I came to Lander and uh, got my PhD from Florida State University in uh, 2000. And uh, my uh, earlier academic appointment was out at Western State College in Colorado. Um, but I moved to Greenwood in, in 2005, and um, it probably wasn't too long after I had been here that, that I had heard about um, a music establishment where one of my favorite bands uh, had played, and, and, and that band is called Widespread Panic, and um, some of you may know that name. They're a rock group out of Athens, Georgia, and they came on the scene in the uh, mid-1980s. And I first heard about them in about 1990 when I was uh, working up at uh, Table Rock Mountain in North Carolina for Outward Bound. So I moved to Greenwood and I hear through friends and acquaintances that back in the day, uh, widespread panic had played, you know, some concerts in Greenwood. And that kind of, you know, struck my fancy, struck my interest. And, and I wondered just where, where that would have been. Uh, I know that the Civic Center used to have some music shows and things, actually some pretty big, you know, country shows, I think back in the day and uh, maybe some big, you know, rock and roll shows and, and hip hop shows and things. Um, so I asked people, well, was it the Civic Center? No, it wasn't the Civic Center, it was someplace up, up in Hodges. And the only place that I knew up in Hodges at the time was Otis Harvley's uh, tiny little bar called the Waterhole. 
And uh, I had driven by that on a number of occasions, and it really is just a little dive bar. I mean, the place is pretty tiny. And so I, I knew it couldn't be that place. And then finally, um, I realized that it was the building adjacent to Harvey's, which uh, was Jackson Station. And uh, if you've been in the Greenwood area and, and driven up to Greenville from Greenwood and go on 25, you'll go right past it. It's about nine miles uh, due north of Greenwood. Uh, but if you take, like a lot of us do, if you take Grace Street out and then Cokesbury Highway uh, up to where the, um, you know, the, the Diana pet food place is now, you'll miss it entirely. And so it's, it's the kind of a thing where, you know, you, you might live in the area for a long time and, 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 and never come across it. But like I said, if you drive straight up 25, you'll see it. And so, um, so I finally figured out that that's where Jackson's, uh, that's where widespread panic had played, uh, but didn't really think, you know, too much of it beyond that, you know, the years go by and, and, uh, then in 2000 and, um, 14, um, I ended up uh, hosting a little live music event at John Holloway's uh, studio. Uh, it was actually outside on, on the back patio. Some of you may remember that John used to have, who's a, John Holloway is a, is a, a photography professor here at Lander, and he uh, has his own uh, art studio uh, uptown Greenwood. And for about 10 years, well, not quite 10 years, uh, he would have live music events there. And um, so I was the sponsor of one event in 2014 by a singer songwriter by the name of Walter Salas, Walter Salas Humara, who uh, was uh, with, used to be with a band called The Silos. Anyway, long story short, um, Walter ended up uh, staying uh, with me uh, that night to defray costs and we're having breakfast in, in the morning and he says, uh, you know, tell me about Jackson Station. And um, I told him, you know, what I, what, I, what I learned. And I said, well, you know, why do you ask? And he said, well, I was just having dinner with a friend of mine, Jeff Calder, another musician in Atlanta. And he was just raving about the place and how, you know, amazing Jackson Station was and how diverse the crowd was and the people and how pe they would just stay up till five o'clock in the morning. And the owners, this guy, Gerald Jackson, this gay, former uh, Navy, you know, medic uh, ran it with his elderly uh, mother and, and, and his boyfriend. And it just seemed like such an interesting place that I decided to do a little asking around. And so I, I, I you know, talked to some of my friends and acquaintances and, uh, and they said, oh yeah, uh, that's, that's Jackson Station. Uh, Gerald, um, you know, that's, that's, that's the place where the owner got hit in the head with an ax. And I, I said, uh, excuse me, what, what, what do you mean by, and so I, did, I, dig, I, I was digging a little bit deeper and realized that, you know, not only had, was Jackson Station a, you know, former, uh, you know, blues club in the greater Greenwood area, it was also the site of a very vicious crime. And um, at this point in time, I had just finished up my first book, which, which is called uh, Making Sense of Marshall Ledbetter, The Dark Side of Political Protest, which is available uh, through University Press of Florida. And that story was about uh, this kind of disaffected college student who stormed and occupied the Florida State Capitol in 1990 as an apparent political protest and so on. And so that book had gone to press and I was looking around for another story uh, another kind of longer, you know, um, project, a more you know, substantive project to kind of work on, and so it, it, it occurred to me. I said, well, you know, why not learn more about uh, this place, Jackson Station, and 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 the owners behind it, and the people who went there, and its role in the Greater Greenwood area, and so on and so forth. And so that's how the project started. And I did some initial interviews with, um, you know, some bartenders and some. Uh, musicians, and then um, it just kind of snowballed from there. And uh, with the exception of um, about two years in, in 16 and uh, 2016 and 17, when I was uh, working on a, on a grant relating to sea level rise and uh, storm surge in, in Charleston, I've been pretty much working on, on this project ever since. 
And so the book is uh, really kind of a social history of uh, this place, Jackson Station, and the owners of it, principally Gerald Jackson and his long-term boyfriend, Steve Jackson. And uh, Gerald was from the Hodges area and uh, his family was from the area. His uh, grandfather um, actually owned a general store um, back in the day, I think in, in 1919, uh, I believe, is when he, he opened that general store, which was then taken over by Gerald's uh, father, um, who unfortunately passed away. Um, Gerald grows up in the area, goes to um, Northside Middle School, attends Lander for a while. I'm not sure exactly when. Um, didn't graduate, I believe. Um, but uh, in 60, I think it's 69, uh, ships out to Vietnam. And he was a, a Navy medic, and he was attached to a uh, to a you know Marine company, and uh, he would you know he would provide medical uh, you know attention as best he could on the battlefield in in Vietnam, and so he had kind of you know obviously a very uh, you know salient uh, traumatic experience emotional experience over in Vietnam. He comes back. And he decides to open up a blues bar, and uh, he he uses uh, this uh, this old train depot. Um, the depot itself um, was actually built in 1870, and uh, it was one of two train depots in Hodges. Um, it was associated with the the um, Greenville to Columbia, Greenville and, and Columbia line initially later Southern Railroad. And um, Gerald had been thinking about opening up a blues club. And um, he had this property, which is at the, uh, at the corner of 175 and, uh, and um, 25 right there on, on the highway. And uh, he saw some railroad people, um, you know, kind of milling around uh, near the old Corley's. Um, now it's the the one stop up in uh, up in Hodges, and uh, he ended up talking to these railroad men and and purchasing this old railroad station actually for a dollar, <laughs> and uh, moved it with uh, the help of some of his friends on a huge trailer out to the uh, out to twenty five, where eventually he set up this blues club, and um, it lasted. Um, for about 20 years, actually, uh, you know, I, I, I date it to, until 1990, which is kind of the, um, that's the primary focus of my history, because that was the night of the vicious attack on Gerald Jackson in the parking lot. Um, but other people, you know, tried to operate Jackson Station for a few years after that. And um, from about 1978, um, you know, and to the early 90s, it was, you know, the place to be in Greenwood County. It was the only late night place to be in Greenwood County. The uh, operating hours were pretty interesting. It was uh, 5, p uh, 5 p.m. to 5 a.m., <laughs> basically uh, five days a week. And on Saturday uh, morning, it didn't close. Uh, so the only day it wasn't open was, was on Sunday. And uh, they had an amazing array of musicians who played there over the years, including Widespread Panic, as I mentioned, played there nine times. Um, Nappy Brown, the very uh, famous uh, R&B artist, played there a number of times, more so than, than Widespread Panic. Um, many bands from the greater uh, Athens, well, from Athens, Georgia, and also from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, played there. Um, lots of blues music, musicians of, of various kinds, Drink Small in particular, from Columbia, South Carolina. And um, it was known as, as being a very welcoming, diverse place, a very celebratory place. Lander students, as I'm sure some people on the call, would go up there. Uh, Lander administrators would go up there. Larry Jackson would go up there. People like Leonard Lundquist would go up there. Uh, Simran Singh was another administrator, sociologist who would go up there. And then on the other, you know, north of, of Hodges, you have, uh, you know, due west, 
which is of course where Erskine College is, and Erskine and 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 Due West, as far as I know, is a is a dry town, or at least was. Uh, they didn't have any bars or anything like that, and so the Erskine uh, students would come down uh, to Jackson Station as well and kind of meet in the middle. And so um, the book really is at its heart, it's kind of a sociological study of Jackson Station and the role it played in the, you know, greater Greenwood area. Uh, people would come from all over. They would drive from Charleston, come down from Charlotte, come over from Athens, you know, come down from Anderson and so on and so forth and, and really have a very good time. Um, but in reality, there's sort of a number of different narratives which sort of, you know, interweave and kind of overlap through the book. And, you know, one is basically, it's kind of a, a historical account of the structure itself of this physical thing, you know, this railroad depot, which, you know, was um, built in 1870, as I mentioned before. And so I trace, you know, where did this depot come from and what was it used for? And then I talk a lot about kind of the role that the train uh, and the railways played in Greenwood County and, uh, and, and beyond, because, you know, as we, most of us remember, I mean, trains used to be the dominant mode of transportation for people in this country. And, uh, you know, before the automobile, obviously, and, and, um, and so on. And, and with the advent of the, of the rails, um, you could just get around so much more quickly. And there was passenger service actually out of that depot for well over 100 years, which is, uh, which is pretty amazing to, to think about. Um, and actually, um, I don't know if people remember Bronco Rieger, um, who used to work at Lander, he, uh, he got to Lander, I think, in the 60s, early 60s, and he's, he remembers actually, you know, being able to catch a train from Greenwood to take it into Atlanta back then. And so this isn't kind of too distant uh, a memory here. So in addition to sort of the sociological study of this place, Jackson Station, there's another kind of a historical narrative, which is essentially kind of a social history of, um, of Hodges and, and to a lesser extent Greenwood County as well. And then um, I also focus on um, the role that Jackson Station played in the musical career of these, uh, of these artists. And so uh, I go into some depth about the role that Jackson Station played in the career of widespread panic uh, in the career of Nappy Brown. Um, the place really was um, almost single-handedly responsible for resurrecting Nappy Brown's career um, in the late 80s. He basically was washed up as an R&B artist and was working as a janitor in uh, North Carolina. Um, and um, he was doing some gospel music, but it wasn't paying very well. And, and uh, Gerald Jackson managed to hook him up with Bob Margolin, who was the uh, lead guitarist for the Muddy Waters band. And, um, and uh, they played a number of, of shows at Jackson Station and, and beyond. Um, but there's a whole host of, of, of other um, you know, musicians who played there. Uh, Gerald was, was very uh, receptive to um, having diverse uh, musical acts and uh, and female acts, and so he would have all female bands, such as the a band called uh, Sensible Pumps, which and they were out of Whitmire, and um, and it's an all female blues band, which uh, always attracted a lot of attention. And um, so I focus on on um, on as I say on on the role that Jackson Station played, kind of musically, and kind of keeping the spirit of music alive, and, and, and Gerald being a patron of music and the patron of the arts, um, and uh, other musical uh, bands which I discuss in the book. Uh, Swimming pool cues out of Atlanta. They were a quote unquote new wave band. Uh, new wave was a a, a movement that sort of um, came about in opposition to. Uh, kind of the disco of the 1970s. A lot of it was associated with more of like British, uh, you know, post-punk sounds and things. And and bands like um, the uh, Georgia Satellites, they actually played at a Jackson Station as well. Love Tractor, which is another Athens band. And uh, so I did 
a lot of interviews with um, with musicians who had very fond and pleasant memories about Jackson Station and uh, had a great interview with Dave Schools of Widespread Panic. So that was kind of a third thread in the in in the narrative there. And then um, a fourth fret, uh, thread rather uh, has to do with um, essentially the relationship between Gerald and Steve to gay men living openly as gay men in uh, a fairly conservative place, which uh, was another kind of aspect to the story, which I found quite a, interesting from a sociological standpoint, because it's not very common. Uh, it's, it's not common now, and it certainly wasn't common then, but they were both very proud, confident, courageous men who were living openly in a loving gay relationship together um, under the watchful eye of Gerald's mother too. And she's another character, obviously. And she was a widow. Uh, Gerald's father died when he was, uh, when Gerald was quite young. Um, but uh, Mama Jackson, as she was called, um, had a financial stake in the club. She was around a lot. She worked the door and, uh, and, and Gerald would thank her, you know, time and time again for her role in, um, in, in putting you know, the, the, the club together and in making it, it a success. Um, so that's another thread running through the book. And then, um, and, and I guess the fifth thread would, is, the, is the horrible crime that, that happened there when you know, Gerald was uh, viciously assaulted by a patron with a, with a bush ax in the parking lot and left for dead. And, um, and I was lucky enough to, to get a, uh, entire the entire uh, court transcript actually uh, because the, the fellow who attacked him actually tried to appeal it to the Supreme Court and so because of that they made a transcript of of the trial and so I, I have access and I have copies of the entire trial transcript and so that allowed me to sort of piece together uh, what actually happened on the night of uh, it was actually the morning of of, of, of April 7th uh, 1990 when uh, Gerald was uh, viciously attacked by a maniac with a bush ax in the parking lot. Um, but, you know, I think it's, to me, it, it, it has been, you know, a really interesting study and a very interesting story um, because uh, Jackson Station was a very diverse place. It was a very cosmopolitan place. They would have, you know, all sorts of imported beers and wines, you know, way before anybody else did. Um, Gerald was the type of a person who would, uh, who could talk to anybody and anybody was welcome at Jackson station was, you know, regardless of whether or not you were, you know, rich, poor, black, white, gay, or straight, um, you know, redneck or, or lawyer or professor. I mean, a lot of the, you know, Lander professors in the so-called golden age of the Lander Jackson of the uh, Larry Jackson, uh, presidency would go up there and, and, uh, cabaret and, and, and everything, and then go teach their classes the next day. The drinking age obviously was, uh, was different back then. Um, it was uh, 18 until 1984, I believe, and that's when it transitioned to 19 and then to 21. And so it was a place for, for mainly younger people, but older folks would go too, um, given the hours. Um, you could go in there for you know, a beer and a hot dog or a cheeseburger in the afternoon and in, in the, during the week, and it would be more of kind of a, a low key sort of a place. And then if you wanted more of a lively um, live music atmosphere with, uh, you know, very loud uh, amplified sound, um, you would come uh, late night on, on Friday nights and uh, you might stay until uh, the sun came up. I mean, that happened, that happened routinely. And so as a sociologist, I'm especially interested in, in the role that Jackson Station played in bringing people together and kind of crossing, um, you know, different divides, divides based on, you know, identity, divides based on politics, divides based on, on race and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, I, I think it's important not to overstate it. I mean, it's not like it was some sort of a, of, of a utopia, but I think in sort of the the very polarized world that we live in today, when um, you know many people on opposite sides of the political spectrum uh, don't want to have anything to do with each other, I think we need to think of 
of more models of of uh, social interaction um, where people do kind of bridge these walls that we've kind of set up um, artificially between us. And so that's uh, that's essentially an overview without giving too much away because I would I want people to obviously buy the book and and read the book. Um, that's kind of an overview of of the project and um it's out now it's been out for about two months and um i've been getting some very good feedback which has been great um i just got a very nice letter from um hazel bryant who was stephen bryant's uh mother who is stephen bryant's mother and i think she's about 91 now and uh, i sent her three copies of the book as requested and uh, she sent me a very nice letter saying that the book brought back so many memories and it was just like yesterday. And, and she said it was just like, uh, it was just like uh, Steve and Gerald were sort of in her living room kind of talking to her. And so that was, that was really nice to hear. And, um, and there's a few reviews on Amazon, which have been positive. Um, I think as far as the local readers in Greenwood and the greater Greenwood area. I, I, I hope to think I've, I've done pretty well. Um, and we're waiting to get the, uh, the story out to, to, you know, people across the state and also across the South, across the country, hopefully, um, because uh, it, it really was that kind of a place. It was a very special place, a very memorable place. And, and once you went there, you never forgot it. And so I want to kind of reach out to everyone who uh, might have you know, ever gone there to, uh, so they can kind of reminisce and, and reflect upon their memories in relation to the stories of the people in the book. And then for people who uh, never went there, like myself, um, unfortunately, I came to Greenwood in, in 2005, so it had been shuttered for a long time. I like to think that I have kind of recreated the, um, you know, the social universe there so that we can kind of uh, vicariously, um, you know, enjoy the, uh, the pleasures of the place. So I think I'll stop there and maybe uh, turn it over to any questions that people may have. And certainly if anybody has any, any anecdotes about the place, I would love to love to hear them. And um, there may be a second edition, who knows, at some point down the road, and in which case and, uh, it would be good. I, uh, to get, uh, I read uh, about three-fourths of the way through the book, and you very much captured the essence of Jackson Station, uh, as, as you, it was very much a late night uh, venue. You know, mm -hmm. that was, people may have gone somewhere else earlier in the evening, but they ended up at Jackson Station. Now, I can yep. remember many times his mother taking the tickets up, you know, right. when you were coming in. And, uh, you know, inside it, it was, as you said, just you never knew who you may see there. I mean, I, I would meet a lot of students there that happened, happened to be there. And as you said, there were faculty people, there were professional people from town that, that may be there. Interestingly enough, the acoustics and all were really pretty good. You know, that uh, was a... Um, it was a neat place. And when he had some of the good groups in there, I know... I, I was there one night when the sensible pumps were there, and that you it was you talking about social distance, and it was all you could do. <laughs> if somebody moved, you moved too, because it was packed, not only inside but outside on, on the, the decks as well. But the other thing I I, I really uh, learned a little a good bit about Hodges and the north end of the county. You know, mm -hmm. I, I never envisioned. Hodges as a village that had the number of activities and buildings and the uh, reputation. And I, I won't say what it was, but I'll, I'll let everybody read the book, but it was quite interesting. And yeah. also the impact of the railroad on the area. You really right. Right. captured that well. We have one question come in in reference to uh, the status of Jackson Station today. I mean, do you yeah. have anything? 
Yeah, and, and that's addressed kind of at, at, at the end of the book. Um, it, it was it was shut down at least kind of initially in uh, in October of, of 1990. Uh, Gerald was viciously attacked um, in April of that year. And then um, Mama Jackson, Elizabeth Jackson, you know, owned the place. And so, um, you know, she needed to do something with it. And, and, and so she would uh, kind of rent out the space for different things. It would be served as an auction house for a little while and it served as kind of a space for a flea market for a little while. And then a few other uh, people tried to, I think there were maybe two or three attempts uh, of, of reopening it back up, um, but it didn't really have the same magic. And, uh, you know, Gerald uh, was just a very charismatic person and it was his baby, it was his project, it was his idea all along. And, uh, and plus the culture changed. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the, as I mentioned, the uh, legal age, uh, you know, to drink changed. And so you had fewer young people kind of going out and then the police started to crack down more on, you know, drinking and driving, um, which uh, really wasn't, uh, you know, uh, much of an issue. I mean, talking to doing interviews with these people who went there in the, in the late seventies and, and early eighties, I mean, they would have designated drivers and, and so on and so forth, but um, it just, you know, drinking and driving just wasn't perceived as being really a problem. And, uh, and, and, and I don't think that the police either didn't, they didn't pay attention or they didn't have the resources. It was just kind of, you're on your own, you know? Um, and, and obviously that changed very dramatically, um, especially after the death of Strom Thurmond's uh, daughter in, uh, in Columbia uh, from a drunk driver. And so, and then the whole culture changed, obviously, too. But uh, to the to the question, it it is currently it, it was it was bought by a fellow who lives in um, who lives up in uh, Donalds, and his name is Daniel Prince. Uh, he works at a, a local uh, textile uh, textile mill over in Calhoun Falls, and um, and his plan is to uh, is to reopen it. Um, whether or not that, that will happen kind of remains to be seen. You know, this is what he told me uh, about four and a half years ago when I interviewed him for the product. I have seen him since, um, but he purchased the property from uh, Gerald's sister uh, who had uh, inherited it from, uh, from Gerald's mother when she passed away. Ellen Early was, was her name, was the, the sister's name, uh, married name. And... Um, and they sold it, as I said, in, in 2016. And um, it's in pretty good shape. I actually have been in there. It's, uh, you know, you mentioned the acoustics, Randy. I mean, that, that place was made out of uh, some pretty solid timber and um, which was part of the, you know, it reflects the sound, you know, very, very nicely. Um, and, uh, and because of that, it, it's held up amazingly well over time. I mean, the thing is, uh, you know, 151 years old, which I think is, uh, I read in, in your book that it was a uh, some of the discussion with the Southern Railroad people, but an all-weather station, I guess, with the materials that it was yeah built out of. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. So it was made to withstand the elements, and it was made to you know house different uh, you know different products, commodities of the various kinds, cotton and and, and tobacco, you know, being the ones initially. Um, but, um, the plan according to the owner is, is that he will, uh, he, he will renovate it, uh, much like, you know, Gerald renovated it to turn it into a, a club in the first place. It, it, it does need a roof. It does need a, uh, an asphalt parking lot. Um, so whether or not that happens, uh, you know, I think is, is an open question, uh. It's an interesting location, obviously, and, and, and it served the community well in the past. It's kind of, it's like many blues clubs, it's kind of, a, it's at a crossroads, right? It's at the crossroads of, of 25. And, you know, the amazing thing about Jackson Station is that, um, you know, you could get to many places, you know, fairly quickly. And so you, yep. could, you could get to Atlanta, you could get to Athens, you could get to Greenville, get to Charlotte, get to Columbia, get to Augusta. And then from there, uh, you know, you kind of hook into, um, you know, other musical circuits. And so from a musician standpoint, you could uh, plug in and, um, 
and, and play Jackson Station and then go on and play many, many other clubs? Well, you know, again, if, if anyone has any other questions, please let us know. Uh, but I will say you really wove in the four or five different narratives very well. When I was interested, when I was reading it, you know, Drink Small was playing the night of the tragedy and was interested in his perspective uh, and so forth. But again, I, it's just amazing the number of really talented musicians and bands that, uh, that came through, which was a hole in the wall up there, so to speak. Uh, uh, it was uh, one question we had, uh, what was your biggest surprise in, in researching the book? Well, um, let's see, the biggest surprise. Um, Well, there were a number of different surprises. Um, one one thing which was kind of a this was a surprise and also a, a, a bit of a, a actually a major letdown is when I got a, a when I got a, a return piece of mail uh, sent to me. I had actually um, this was early in the project, and I, I knew that Gerald had passed away, but I wasn't aware uh, of what happened to Steve. You know, his his longtime boyfriend. And I found an address uh, somewhere on the internet about uh, you know Steve Steve Bryan's residential address in Columbia, and so I I mailed him a letter and I explained you know what I was doing, and that I'd like to interview him for the project. And then about a week later, that came back saying that you know address unknown essentially, or, you know, no longer at, at, at this address. And then I, I found out later on that, uh, that he had passed away. He died of, of cancer in, in 2014. And so um, I guess the, it, it's disappointing that, that I couldn't get his voice in the book. Um, it's disappointing that I couldn't get Gerald's voice in the book. Um, I, although I have been told that um, somebody at Lander, during the early 1980s did kind of a video, you know, media project in which they interviewed Gerald Jackson about Jackson Station. And, um, you know, what happened to that video cassette, I don't know, but it, it may be out there somewhere. And so we may be able to get Gerald's, you know, perspective at some point, but. Um, that may be something, you know, we can put out on the alumni newsletter for you if anyone had any interest in stories to contact you or whatever. Oh, definitely. Like I said, I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it's, been, it's been doing quite well. And, and I imagine that, I don't know, in, in another few years, they might want to do a second edition or something. And, and it'd be great to add, add a few more stories in there. Um, we had a... Uh, uh, an alumni, 1984 alumni, sent a note that uh, he spent a good bit of time at Jackson Station and said he still pointed it out to his wife whenever they drive by there and talk about what a great place it was was to go. Um, yes, there, there's so again, many. There were so many things there from uh, socially and everybody having a great time there. The music was unbelievable. I, I, that still just amazes me the, the variety and volume of uh, great musicians who came through. Yes, and it was a great place to get a, a cheeseburger, or a, they they called it the Spur Burger because yeah. uh, the uh, it used to be on the Spur, the railroad Spur, going right. out to Abbeville, and um, and they uh, they they were known for their hot dogs and Gerald would make his own chili to put on the hot dogs and they had amazing grilled cheese sandwiches as well and so uh you know you, you could see uh, somebody an, an enterprising person opening it up and and offering you know yeah yes yeah. you know sandwiches and burgers and you know burger joint kind of like uh kind of like sports but you know interestingly sports break opened up in 1990 which was the year that Gerald was attacked and so I think that that they were probably that was probably one motivation, right? Uh, they had they saw the business of what you know Jackson Station was doing, and they basically would tell people, well, there's no need to go out of town late night. You can go to sport, and so 
you know, the sports break here in town, I think used to be open until about four or so. I'm not sure what his hours are now. And before we, we go, you know, I've got a uh, copy of your book that I picked up at McCaslin's. Is there other sources you want to let folks know about how to purchase the book? Or? Well, the book is, if you're in Greenwood, you can pick it up at, at McCaslin's, as, as Randy said. Uh, if you are online, uh, you can pretty much go to your favorite uh, online, you know, bookstore. Um, it's on it's on Amazon. Um, you know, that's that's the big gorilla, obviously, in terms of the book publishing. And so it's it's definitely on Amazon. There's copies there. There's Barnes and Noble, uh, Powell's.com. You can also get it at Walmart.com. Um, I'm not sure about the actual store, um, but it's definitely available at Walmart.com. Um, it's available at uh, Target.com. Um, there's also an audio book, which is available through Audible. So if you uh, prefer to uh, listen to, um, you know, your stories these days, then, uh, then, then that's an option. You can also get it in a CD, I just realized, on Amazon. So you could purchase it, it that way. Um, I've also done a couple of... Um, other kind of podcasts and things. And so if people are interested, if they, if you just Google my name, you know, Daniel M. Harrison at Lander, it'll probably take you to my website and you can listen to a couple of other interviews, which I've done um, about Jackson station. Um, I, I think there was another question coming in here. Wasn't there about something? Uh, will you have a signing event? I, I would love to have another signing event. Um, we, we did one, we had a book release party in January um, at John Holloway's and that was a good event, but it was, it was quite socially distanced um, and masked and everything. And um, I'm hoping that there'll be a number of Jackson Station related musical acts at this year's Festival of Discovery. I think our listeners are probably aware of the you know, blues cruise in Greenwood, which is one of my favorite events in, uh, in, in town, as long as the, uh, as long as the temperature isn't too hot. Um, but, uh, last year, um, they, the organizers of that festival actually asked me for my list of musicians that played at Jackson station. And I gave it to them and they reached out to a bunch of them and had set them up to play at last year's Festival of Discovery. Now that was canceled, obviously. And so now they're gonna you know, do it again this, uh, this year. And so I'm hoping that they will bring many of the musicians that they contacted last year to this year's Jackson Station. And if so, uh, I hope to maybe set up a little booth there or something and maybe have a signing event there um, or uh, maybe at, uh, Homecoming next year, I think I'll set up a booth. Mike and I had already kind of talked about that. I was gonna, I was hoping to do something this year at, at homecoming, but I was, I was out of town. No, that'd be a great idea. I'm sure if there's anything we could do to help you as, as far as the signing event, we'll sure be able to do it. Uh, before we close, I, I, I wanna reiterate what I told you while before we went live that uh, I was really impressed with the you captured the essence of uh, Jackson Station and the amount of research. And, you know, I guess before I got the book, I, how do you, how are you going to, uh, uh, well, here's one more question. Any ideas about how Gerald and Steve were able to fit into uh, Hodges and Greenwood? Yeah. I, I know, he, he says, I know yeah. Gerald did people favors he sure helped me one time when I need cash on Sunday before ATM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, hi, Bob. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you came. Uh, I'm, I'm still waiting on that review. Bob said that he was going to write a, a review about the book for me, for me. I English. will, I will. Good, good, good. So I'm, I'm going to hold you to that. Um, but, um, how do they fit in? Well, they were already kind of in, you know, um, especially Gerald, who, whose roots go very deep in, in Hodges, you know, going back to his father, Matthew Ed Jackson before him, and then, then his grandfather, uh, Arthur, Arthur Jackson. And so, um, you know, Gerald was, you know, he, he, was a, he was a Southerner before he was an American, and he was very proud of his Southern roots. He was very proud of being 
you know, from South Carolina, from Hodges. And I think, um, you know, he, he was a member of the, of, of the, of the area, right? He was of the, of the, of the, uh, of Hodges. He, he was, he was a well-respected citizen. Um, the fact that he was a, a Vietnam veteran, I think too, probably, um, helped him out, uh, especially kind of negotiating maybe some people who would uh, maybe cast aspersions on his character for, for being gay. Um, but, um, you know, I think he was just a, a very charismatic, from what I understand, he was a very charismatic, kind man um, who, you know, would take care of you. He would, he would take care of everybody. You know, he, he lived according to the old biker code, which is, you know, you treat me good and I'll treat you better and you treat me bad and I'll treat you worse. And, uh, and, and that was kind of the code that he lived by. Um, Steve was from Liberty, South Carolina, you know, not, not too far away. And, um, and, and, uh, you know, together they, they made a really good team. Steve was basically the manager of the place and, and Gerald was the host and they had, and they had others, but um, you know, I, I think that, I think that people just, knew that it was a very special place, that it was such a unique place. And uh, they would take care of you at Jackson Station. They would remember your name. They would remember your drink. They, they really kind of wanted you to be there. And, um, and that's not true, I think, for a lot of establishments today. I mean, you could stay at Jackson Station all day long if you wanted to, <laughs> all, not, all night long. And as long as you, you know, uh, could afford a few hot dogs and, and, and some beers, you know, that would be okay. And he would provide discounts for people, uh, you know, when the trains went by, you get a discount on the beer and so on and so forth. Um, so I think people realized that, that it was, it was a very special place and they were very special individuals. And unfortunately, uh, one individual uh, had to, you know, go, go on and, and, and ruin it that that evening uh, when he viciously attacked Gerald in the parking lot. Dave, this has been a good evening. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Uh, we look forward to uh, anything we can help you with in, in the future. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me and thanks for logging on everybody. And um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me or call me at Lander and hope to meet people in person um, maybe at the Festival of Discovery this, this coming summer. Okay, everyone, we've enjoyed and look forward to seeing you later. Thanks. Okay, thanks everybody. Okay, bye.